This is a big, big bird. The biggest you're likely to see. Its wings can measure two and a half meters from tip to tip. It's a white-tailed eagle, a member of the group of raptors called sea eagles. And the white-tailed eagle is now back, here in Scotland where it belongs. Conservationists like the RSPB have worked hard to bring these magnificent birds back to the British Isles, where they have been absent for many years. They have been reintroduced to the west coast of Scotland and also now here on the east. This is Loch Leven near Perth. Claire Smith is looking after the white-tailed eagles that have been released here. She's the RSPB's eagle officer for the east coast and it's her job to protect these new arrivals and help them get established. Most of my year is spent um, keeping track of all the eagles that we've released. Um, this is the fifth year of the project, so we've already released 64 birds. Um, we've got about 45 of those still alive. Um, and we're going to do another two years, two years of releases because we want to release um, 100 white-tailed eagles. When the eagles are released, they are fitted with radio transmitters so Claire can track where they go. So how many can she find here today? Uh, one, because we picked one up, yeah. I mean, the young birds range over a really wide area, so we had four birds that spent the last four or five months feeding here over the winter. The ducks and geese that spend their winter in the estuary make an attractive meal for the white-tailed eagles. But come spring, this source of prey moves on, and so too do the eagles. It is hoped they will eventually return here to nest and breed and establish an East Coast population. And this is the ultimate goal of the project. Over on the West Coast of Scotland, there is now a breeding population, but it's taken a while. White-tailed eagles were first reintroduced here in 1975. The RSPB's officer on the Isle of Mull is Dave Sexton. Well, the project has now reached a bit of a milestone in that we've gone beyond 50 breeding pairs of white-tailed eagles on the west coast. Uh, every year we're adding two or three new pairs to the breeding population. So, um, you know, we could be talking several hundred birds now in the wild on the west coast. The project's in a good place now and it's going in the right direction. White-tailed eagles were native to the British Isles, but they were ruthlessly exterminated in previous centuries. The last Scottish bird was killed in 1918. They can still be found elsewhere in Europe. In Norway, there is a large and healthy population. And, the most area on that. and it is here that young chicks are collected for the Scottish reintroduction programmes. For the past four summers, Claire Smith has been joining Norwegian wild bird experts to gather the young chicks. They only take a chick if there are two or more in the nest. The adult birds don't seem to mind so long as there's one hungry mouth left for them to feed. These chicks are only five weeks old, but they're already quite a size. And scrambling down the mountain with a precious chick in a bag isn't easy. Over a two-week period, they try to gather 15 to 20 birds to take back to the east coast of Scotland. A chartered aircraft takes them back to Edinburgh. The chicks don't realise it, but this plane journey is their first flight in the air. From Edinburgh, they travel to specially built aviaries where they will be fed and cared for until they are old enough to fly. We bring the chicks up from Edinburgh to our secret release site in Fife. The first thing we do is line them up according to size so that when we put them into the cages later on, you've got bigger ones with big ones and smaller ones with smaller ones. So it means you, the younger birds don't get bullied and things like that. And then each bird um, gets checked over by our vets. So first of all, they give them all a physical check to check they haven't damaged themselves um, on the flight on the way over. We check for things like parasites and diseases. And the other things we look at are lead and mercury levels and pollution levels. 
So we feed the birds twice a day. The really important thing is that they don't associate people with food because you don't want them to become tame and you don't want them to see a, a person when they're out in the wild and think, oh, that's, that's where I get my food from. So what happens is all they see is um, a hand, a gloved hand coming in the back and dropping a chunk of food off. They get a really nice um, mixed diet, so they get a lot of fish. That's quite important for their, their growth and their health to get their vitamins. We also get a lot of deer, so deer are shot quite widely in Scotland as we get those. And sometimes we find a bit of roadkill for them as well. So if, you know, if we do find a rabbit or a pheasant, things like that, we will pick those up for them. And it also means they learn to pull apart different types of, of food. So it's always quite interesting the first time you maybe put a rabbit or something in and the eagles will pick it up by the ear and by the feet and, and not quite figure out how to get into it. And then the other bird will, will start tearing into it and that's when they get their cue of, of how to, to work this out. So. The birds will be in these pens for about eight weeks and Claire and her helpers keep their distance and stay out of sight. But isn't it tempting to go in and nurture them a bit? <laughs> Um, no, not really, because I think the most, Im the most important thing is that, you've, is that the reintroduction works. It's not about having, this isn't about me having pet eagles, it's about re-establishing a, a species in the wild. Um, and you also have to remember that you are often picking birds up dead, you know, you do pick up, pick up a few dead birds a year, so you don't want to get too attached to them. The final task is to fit small radio transmitters to each of the birds. So they wear them like a small backpack. They weigh 70 grams, which sounds quite a lot, but because the eagles are weigh up to about seven kilograms, it's the equivalent of me carrying my binoculars, so it's a fairly small weight. The transmitters have a life of about five years, after which time the harness degrades and the transmitters drop off. By mid-August, the birds are 12 weeks old and have developed enough to fly. This is the age they would leave the nest in the wild, so the moment has come to open up the release panels. Some birds immediately fly strongly away, but for others, taking to the air has its problems. Claire is never sure which will be the floppers that don't go very far. Some are floppers and some are flyers, and it's, um, they can often surprise you, often birds that have been bouncing around in the cages and flapping and looking like they're really, really ready to go. And they might start flying off very strongly and then they almost get distracted by something and that's when they sort of stop flapping and will crash down into the spruce. Or The other thing is they try and land on things that aren't always quite appropriate. So you do often see birds sort of hanging upside down and not really sure what to do. Fortunately, Claire is on hand to see they're all right. Any birds that get stuck on the ground, you know, we do go in and check they've not broken legs or wings. And the really important thing for the first night is to make sure that they're off the ground. So if you can just try and sort of flush them up onto a, a tree and make sure they're not on the ground in case of foxes and badgers and things like that. For the first four months of freedom, these birds also get a little more support to boost their chances of survival. There's a whole new environment for them. They often don't really know where to go for food or where to find things. So what we do to give them a helping hand is, is from the middle of August when we release them right up until about the middle of December is we put food out for them on the roof of the cages. Um, so normally deer and rabbits two or three times a week on, on the roof. We've learned really from what the birds in the wild do. So what they'll do is, is sometimes take food to them or the young birds if they've struggled to find food for a couple of days will, will come back to their parents and harass them for food. Once they get the hang of fending for themselves, the young eagles can range widely up and down the east coast and inland. Some have even made it over to the west coast where they've joined the reintroduced eagles there. A team of volunteers keeps an eye on where they've travelled and a lot of the information is shared on the internet. On Mull, Dave Sexton maintains a regular blog and Twitter feed to keep the many eagle enthusiasts informed. And one particular story has generated a lot of interest. It involves a young bird called Kellen. Well, yeah, we had an injured bird. Uh, quite often young eagles will get into trouble after they fledge. And this young bird um, was a, a young bird called Kellen. Um, he had injured one of his wings, um, the right wing it looked like. Uh, we think he had fallen uh, having tried to land. And um, he was in a pretty bad way. He couldn't move, um, he couldn't fly away. So this is him clearly in a bad state, really. The RSPB doesn't treat injured birds, but the Scottish SPCA does, and their vets took Kellen and operated on his broken wing. 
This is him at their wildlife rescue center in Fife, recovering from surgery. Then, one cold winter's day, they brought Kellen back to his familiar territory. The SSPCA did a superb job with him, and we got him back after four months, and they'd fixed up his wing and his leg and let him go. After a final photo call, he flew off. But he only went a short distance and settled on the beach. Would his repaired wing be strong enough to enable him to hunt for food and fend for himself? He has been fitted with a small radio transmitter and Dave Sexton is able to track his movements to see how he's coping. Yeah, we're just heading over to the west side of the Isle of Mull to a place called Loch Nakiel, and it's the area where we released him. So, so far so good, he's doing okay, um, but today we're just gonna go and track him. Every last white-tailed eagle that we have is a precious bird and it's worth the time and effort. On the shore of Loch Nakiel, Dave Sexton gets out the radio tracker and tunes to the frequency of Kellen's transmitter. Sure enough, there's a strong signal coming from one direction. And then a familiar shape rises above the hillside of a white-tailed eagle being mobbed by other birds. Could this be Kellen? He was flying, yeah, it was a fantastic view of him. Kellen was just flying, which is the first time I've seen him fly properly. And a buzzard was coming in and he was rolling over and putting his talons up just like he's meant to do, so uh, that is fabulous. White-tailed eagles are more than a match for smaller birds like buzzards, crows and seagulls. But what does take a toll are the illegal activities of humans. The biggest threat to our young white-tailed eagles, both Clare's population and here on the west coast, is uh, poisoning. There are still a few estates and a few farms that just don't like them and still act as if it was the Victorian era. And there's no doubt that eagles can take some lambs. Of course, most of them are sick and dead, but there are some healthy, viable lambs that are taken as well. And so where that happens, it's important that we're there to help advise on what can be done, encourage entrance into the management schemes that Scottish Natural Heritage offer. There's all sorts of ways around it, and working with the farmers is absolutely crucial to the success of this project. One of the farmers that Dave regularly talks to is Lachlan McLean. Hey, Lachlan. All right, good to see you. Yep. Oh, look, you've got one of your, one of the birds, just seagull. Yep. I think that's one of the adults from, uh, from over here, one of the pairs that nests uh, right on the edge of your property. Lachlan and his brother run a large flock of hill sheep that spend much of their time grazing on the higher ground. The rugged terrain produces what they hope is a premium crop of good flavoured lamb. But farmers have to share this remote space with eagles that also have their eye on the high quality meat. Well, I, I, I actually spoke to someone that was in, uh, involved in the tourist industry and, and he was saying, we actually saw an eagle flying past and he was saying, well, isn't that a lovely sight? And I said, well, we, my perspective is it's actually flying either for or from us with 40 pound out of my pocket, whereas he was in the tourist side, I said, it's actually probably got the opposite effect for you. So I said, there is two ways of looking at it. The main benefits for an area like this that the white-tailed eagles have bought is an incredible increase in wildlife tourism. So it's bringing money and people to an island economy. But also they do a job up in the hills of scavenging and clearing up carcasses. And they're just part of the ecosystem that was missing. And it's right that it's now back. At this Forestry Commission hide near Loch Frieza on Mull, ranger-guided tours bring visitors every day to a spot where they can get a close view of nesting birds without disturbing them. There we go, that's on the nest now. With luck, they may even get to see white-tailed eagles nesting and raising their chicks, bringing them food until they fledge. Claire Smith has travelled over from the east to visit Dave Sexton and observe his nesting eagles. Her birds are coming up to the age where they may start to pair up and breed. She can learn from earlier projects the signs she should look for that breeding may be about to happen. Ah, that's a good sign. So there, are there any 
behaviours? You see them? Except, do you see them flying together? Or? Yeah, they they go up quite high mm -hmm. and lots of calling. Yeah, uh, you definitely hear that. Um, and then they're just twisting over and touching talons. Yeah, we see the young, very young birds doing it. So even not long after they've been released, when they're about four months old. Yeah. So that's something that was quite surprising to me was to see these four-month-old birds, you talon grappling, and I, th I think they're almost just playing and trying it out and trying out their strengths. And right. The other thing we noticed is when you start getting two birds, a couple might stick together yeah. and they start roosting. Yeah. And we've definitely found that roosts turn into nests. Yeah. And sure enough, occasionally there's a few sticks and a bit of down. Yeah. If you get a nice autumnal day when it's calm and the sun's out, that mm. seems to spark a bit of activity and they will do some nest building then. Yeah, that's really interesting to know because with the radio tracking we are able to, to locate a lot of roosts, right. so it's good to know to keep an eye on them. As Claire tracks her eagles, she makes a careful note of where they roost and some of them do seem to be heading for the same spot, possibly the makings of a breeding pair in future years. But even before they nest and breed, the sight of a white-tailed eagle high in the sky is unforgettable and one to treasure. If you see a white-tailed eagle, there's really no doubting it. That fantastic pale head, the yellow beak, and that gleaming white tail, when that's up in the blue sky and the sun hits it, you know, you know you've seen your white-tailed eagle.